A.T. Lewis from the University of Oklahoma, and his paper is called Ordinary or Extraordinary, the Archaeology of Wishmoing.
So now we're going to discuss some aspects of three different cultures. Let's review some of the terminology that's used to describe the sites and the uh, artifacts associated with them. With Pocket Point, we see things like the grandest expression during the late arcade, a manifestation of complex hunter gatherers. When discussing these sites, and particularly the Poverty Point site, archaeologists refer to the sites as truly one of a kind. <coughs> Exceptional transcends its normal function and one of the world's unique hunter gatherer sites. When describing the artifacts associated with Poverty Point, we get to terms like extraordinary vessels, the key term I've been talking about throughout this. We see similar things for the Avena and Hopewell culture, a fascinating woodland phenomenon, the paradigm of woodland culture, a middle woodland culture status. In the literature, we see mounds characterized as elaborate geometric patterns, truly monumental, and impressive mounds with um, earthen embankments. The artifacts are said to be precious and unusual, and truly exotic. Now let's look at how Rister and Cooch have been described in the literature. We see descriptions that are very um, lacking in adjectives and instead focus on identifying attributes of the culture. We see a similar strategy with the sites, phrases like small black earthen mounds. The most positive adjective I could find in the literature was the word important, um, which I tend to agree with, but it is very important. Um, when we turn to artifacts, we see the increase in adjectives but in comparison to that, those used to describe Poverty Point and Hopewell, these aren't as positive. We see crude workmanship, simple beads, even burial objects, usually are vibrant artistic expression are simply categorized as well-made. Next, we have a few examples of the sites that occurred between the three archaeological cultures. So first, this is the Mound A at Poverty Point. Luckily, I am from Louisiana, so hiking through sites where they're flooded is a common occurrence for me, so there was no unique things there. Next, we have a central mound from Mound City in Ohio. And then last, we have a Fushmaline site in eastern Oklahoma. So now let's turn towards some research I've been conducting at the University of Oklahoma. My initial interest targeted two aspects, aspects of the Troy Adams site in Oklahoma County. First, I wanted to conduct multivariate mass analysis of demitage to determine lipid reduction strategies taking place on site. Additionally, similar to my research at Poverty Point, I wanted to identify raw materials to see how that answered questions about exchange and mobility. In review of the demitage from the site, attributes such as platform size, weight, cortex percentage, and raw material were reported. These results show that biphase reduction was primarily taking place on site, with core reduction taking place off site, likely in where it was originally being gathered. Raw material was separated into 14 different types, and the top 10 raw materials um, are shown here graphed um, right beside it. The results show an emphasis on local materials in the Washita. This data shows that a significant amount of time um, for, small, for stone tools was invested in gathering quartzite and solidified sandstone, which if you're familiar with the material, is not high, a high quality material and wouldn't really be considered something that people would seek after to make these tools. As my research um, grew, I was interested in determining trade and other procurement strategies for lithic material. I've been comparing the data from these sites previously examined by Luther Lee. I've been comparing the data to see if these sites would hold up to the same level of procurement strategy. We see at, HA, at HS um, 111, Luther identified 90% of the raw material was coming from local sources from the Ozark. At LT 11, 99% of the lithic raw material examined from the Wichita. As you can see, these results are very similar to what I'm seeing at LS 33. Local um, archaeologists that have much more experience than me in the area have actually said that the Ozark materials may be um, prominent in the river bases, which may just uh, determine the difference that I'm seeing between LT11 and, L and LF33. Additionally, the Fushmataha site is another site that I'm looking to examine um, in field comparison. Initial field observations show that majority of the raw material is from the Tater Hills area, reinforcing my interest that there 
is a local focus going on. So reviewing the terminology, we see a dramatic differences in how they were described, a strict dichotomy between the poverty point and Hopewell cultures in comparison to the Fuchelini. The grand or paragon adjectives used to describe the poverty point and Hopewell are in this contrast to the descriptive routes used to describe Fuchelini. Poverty point and Hopewell have remarkable or truly monumental and one-of-a-kind sites, but we don't see that, you, that those terms used for Fuchelini. Now, when discussing artifacts, I want to point out that the majority of these artifacts are, dropped, are usually describing burial items from, made from non local material. Amongst Fuchsmaling, the items associated with burials or other significant or ceremonial objects are simply referred to as well made. Previous reports on funerary or ceremonial objects, such as boat stones or stone gorges, suggest that they were also constructed of locally available materials indicating a true focus on local resources and potentially limited mobility. I do need to note, however, there is said to be copper artifacts at Lister Bay site, but archaeologists have serious concerns about this, thinking that maybe the Sir Harlan phase, which are later, which are later Caddo uh, culture, which has just been lowered into deeper stratigraphic layers due to them being midden deposits. Now we can see um, we can elevate how Fushmaline, evaluate how Fushmaline culture is based on these characteristics. So, monumental architecture. No. Fushmaline is usually described, sites are usually described as small, with, very, with the very idea of them being midden, an area of refuge, making them not fit into this category. Exchange networks with exotic non local materials. Once again, no. We see this an intense focus on local resources and a lack of exotic artifacts like those seen at Poverty Point in the Postal Culture. Artifact assemblages full of highly decorated and stylistic objects. No. Typically, very points are usually just referred to as crude. Um, and the pottery of the Williams Plain is usually thick and undecorated until the later Fuchsmaline phases. So with all of this, it is very easy to, cap to classify the Fuchsmaline culture of eastern Oklahoma as extraordinary. Now, beyond the bias that every archaeologist thinks the archaeological culture or the regional focus that they are interested in is extraordinary, and therefore I would of course say that the Fuchsmaline culture is extraordinary, what's really led me to this classification? To me, the differences between these groups are fascinating. Instead of participating in large exchange networks that put in a value on non-local resources, these people seem to focus on local resources. From the landscape they lived in, from the landscape they managed, and from the landscape they were active participants in. While the rest of the Eastern Midlands were being pulled or pushed towards these large social systems that put an emphasis on non-local resources, mound construction, and other social practices, the later cave and woodland people of eastern Oklahoma were not. While it's difficult to determine if this was from self-exclusion or exclusion by others, it still stands in contrast to what the rest of the eastern woodlands were experiencing during the time. So the cultural attributes that would make these people labeled as ordinary is the very thing I believe that makes them extraordinary. That diversity in the archaeological record left behind by the people throughout the eastern woodlands is what makes all these cultures discussed today truly extraordinary. When we focus on the objects instead of, I mean, so when we focus on the people instead of the objects, the uniqueness of each archaeological culture has a chance to shine through. So I want to say thank you for um, giving me the chance to speak today. I want to thank the organizers for organizing a extraordinary conference. So thank you. It was then re-excavated 
due to some mistakes in which sites they were uh, yelling thought they were entering, and they excavated the WPA backfield. Um, the unfortunate part is that we lost no spatial and control data other than it was coming from that site, but it was one of the few Fusilini sites that actually offer debitage because all the others were mostly excavated by the WPA. So it's one of those good but bad situations. And so we're still getting a lot, I'm still getting a lot of data from this. It's just I don't have the, you know, the best spatial and control data from it. Thank you. Where is it, sorry, where is it in relation to uh, Calhoun? It, so uh, it's in Lafleur County near Worcester Lake. It's part of the Worcester River project that was um, found the majority of the Fusilini sites. The um, LT11 that Luther Leaf looked at was another site that had debitage at it. So oh, okay. it was one of the only other sites that had debitage. Um, the site in Pushman Taha that I will be comparing it to in the future is the same thing. I'm mean, going to hopefully be excavating it and getting access, so I'll have the debitage for that as well. Okay. Um, and then the site uh, HS111. Also, he looked at Debitage from it. So it's just sites that had Debitage in it, so we get a broader range of what was actually going on with, with both stone tools and Debitage from there. And that's the most important thing that WPA and the. Yeah, yeah, they didn't worry about that. Uh, the, the collection I'm working with now at the Troy Adams site, they also miss, I, I still have like duplicated access that they missed some things like that in their control from the w, like WPA in it. So there's still a, a, a large amount of. Some tools that they missed in their initial excavation stage for them in their respective submission excavation. Talk just a little bit about where you're going with your dissertation kind of next. Yes, so um, one of my goals to look at is I'm focused primarily on the late archaic and early woodland periods of this transition from Worcester and Bushwing basis. Um, previously in literature, too, um, Bushwing has seen, been seen as like a transformational uh, culture going into the, the cabins um, and things with things like spire and you know, the spire is amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm more interested in the other end of it and looking at things like cultivation, especially with these double kids axes, which are not fully axes, they're garden hose, um, and looking at this focus to see if we're seeing things with cultivation and this limited mobility that's going on and the reason why this limited mobility is going on. Um, I don't have it in this presentation. Um, at the Troy Adams site, most of the raw materials, like I talked about, including the uh, burial objects and everything like that, are from uh, locals or locally available. The only ones that are not are uh, embedded projectile points that it looks like they come from other sites. Um, so it looks like there's a Real focus on just inter interplaying with the local resources there, um, which I think is really interesting. It's kind of the it's, you know extreme opposite of what we're seeing with things like deposit points as well and things like that. Yes. Uh, in that area, though, there's a lot of uh, different types of rock formations. Is that Valley um, 
turnout there. Um, but even with that, a lot of the projector points and um, other selling tools are still being really energy strong. Where science will collect things on the bed. How does that fit? How does this approach fit to the broader application? So the one thing that I'm, I'm looking at with that is, um, like I mentioned, is this. It will be difficult to tell about if they're self-excluding themselves from these major movements and things like that, but it still gives us an idea about what it's like on the other side. So these things like the poverty point and so forth and things like that, there's still a cost for those groups to be incorporated into that. And seeing this comparison for what it's like for a group that's not even, I'm gonna say being wrapped into, I don't there's probably a better term for it, but that's what I'm gonna use. Um, being wrapped into these big social movements that are going on in the rest of the eastern woodlands and what it's like for these groups that are not and how they're developing in comparison to those that are, are being um, wrapped into these different social networks. Any other questions? Thank you.